Gospel is according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell at his, on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, We're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace. Peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I always love this epistle reading because Paul talks about learning a secret. And it takes me back to my childhood. Remember this time of year, the great secret was, where are the presents? Where did mom and dad hide the presents? And if you were lucky, if you stumbled across it or you heard them whispering, you could actually learn that secret, couldn't you? And then if you were foolish, you would actually go and look. And you would destroy the whole excitement, listen boys, you would destroy, destroy the whole surprise of figuring out on Christmas morning, of being surprised on that day. Life is full of secrets. And especially when you're a child, secrets are greatly treasured. Middle schoolers love to have secrets. Usually the secret is who they like or who likes them. And it's an exciting thing to know someone's secret. It means they trust you, right? If they tell you, if they entrust to you a secret, or if you overhear, you feel special. Paul talks about a secret too, but it's a different kind of secret. Those secrets that I've mentioned, you know, where the presents are hidden, or who likes who in grade school, those are what we might call kind of minor secrets. They're informational secrets. And you can learn those things if someone tells you. You can learn those things if you overhear, if you're eavesdropping. You can even kind of stumble upon that kind of a secret. But it's not really that impressive, is it? As soon as you find out the secret, this is the whole, um, this is the whole problem with knowing where the Christmas presents are. As soon as you find out the secret, it kind of loses its interest. But the kind of secret Paul is talking about is the kind of secret that we should really call a mystery. I know I've said this in Bible class and in sermons before, but there's a difference between secrets and mysteries, right? A secret, as soon as you know it, loses its enjoyment. But a mystery, a mystery is something you can know that doesn't lose its savor. So think of the mystery of Christ's incarnation. Think of the mystery of Jesus, the Son of God, becoming man in the womb of the Virgin Mary. We're going to celebrate that very soon. That is a mystery that someone can tell you and probably has told you since you were all very small, that Jesus is both God and man. But see, it's not a secret that once you hear it, you say, okay, now I know. So what? <laughs> it is a mystery that once you know you enjoy. And the more you know it, the more you dwell on it, the more you reflect on it, the more you think on it, it actually becomes sweeter and sweeter. Now, we're going to come to Thanksgiving in a minute, but what Paul talks about is learning the mystery or the secret of contentment. And those two things go together, contentment and thanksgiving. But we have to kind of think through how it is that Paul learned this secret of contentment. Because the secret is held out to you. The mystery of being content is not some kind of secret that Paul doesn't want you to discover. It is the kind of secret that is an open secret. It is an open mystery. He tells us what it is. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that is a popular verse, right? Athletes love that verse. They put it on their shoes. They put it on their uniforms because it means, right, if I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, then I'll always win. 
I can make every three-point shot. I can dunk a basketball. Those things never worked out for me. That's the secret of being content, that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But see, it's not the kind of thing that once you hear it, you can say, all right, now I've got it. It's the kind of thing that is learned, that is learned through experience. And that's how Paul learned the secret of being content. He didn't learn the secret because, you know, Barnabas took him aside one day and said, Paul, I've got this awesome secret to tell you. He didn't learn the secret because he met with Peter or John and they said, hey, now, Paul, we've got some special news just for you that we don't tell everybody else. Paul learned the secret of being content through his sufferings. He learned the secret of being content through his hardships. He learned the secret of being content through the trials that he experienced. And Paul has a whole list of experiences that our sufferings this past year really don't even come close to approaching. I mean, this was a guy who was shipwrecked. This was a guy who was bitten by a snake and nearly died. This was a guy who was stoned to death. This was a guy who was constantly hated, constantly persecuted, constantly being chased after. And yet, in the midst of all of that, he learned the secret of being content. That no matter how much all of the other things in life change, Christ is with him. That's the secret of being content. And it's a secret you know, isn't it? It's a secret that none of you should sit here this morning and say, boy, pastor, I never heard that before. It is an open secret, but it is the kind of secret, the mystery, that gets pressed home to you in sufferings. And isn't that what we've learned in the last year, at least something of what we've learned. It is so easy to become discontent. It is so easy because things are bad. It is so easy to become discontent because, well, this Thanksgiving isn't like the ones that have come before. It is so easy to become discontent because we read the news and we hear only bad news. And if you even try to speak good news, what do you hear in response? Well, I read a different study or I heard something else. It is so easy to become discontent because this world seems to be falling apart. But you know the mystery of being content. And so you know the mystery, the secret of thanksgiving. That Christ is with you. That his love for you doesn't change. That his love for you is not here today, gone tomorrow. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy, his steadfast love endures forever. It's not a secret that you haven't heard before, is it? I hope, I pray to God that you've all heard these things before, but it is the kind of thing that is pressed home to you. It is the kind of mystery that comes to you in your sufferings. Just think of our gospel reading as an example. This man will focus on the one who gave thanks. It's always a temptation for the preacher to say, look, only one returned to give thanks. But just think of his situation in life. He had been a leper for who knows how long, And here he's finally cleansed. Here he's finally healed. And the other nine, presumably, run off to go back to their normal life, right? They've got a family. They've got a house. They've got a job. They've got other things to run back to. But this man comes back to Jesus. He returns to Jesus, and it says that he was praising God, giving thanks to God, and fell on his face at the feet of Jesus. And there he found something even better than a temporary blessing. There he found the secret of contentment, that Jesus has mercy on poor lepers, and that that mercy doesn't go away. Right? Those other nine lepers, I wonder if they realized later that Jesus was the true God. I wonder if the gospel came to them at a later point in their life, and they said, oh yeah, we met him before. He healed us before. Of course, we love him and we praise him. But this man, this Samaritan man, this foreigner, He perceived that in Jesus, something greater than a temporary blessing could be found. That in Jesus, something better than just a temporary healing could be received. And so he fell on his face at Jesus' feet and he heard these wonderful words, rise and go your way, your faith has saved you. Not just your faith has made you well, he was already healed. Your faith has saved you. Here is the secret of being content that you have salvation when you have faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus will never disappoint you. Faith in Jesus, trust in Jesus, will never let you down. Faith in Jesus, trust in Jesus, will never run out 
even if you have a bad harvest, which from everything I've heard, it was a pretty good one this year. Or even if you lose your job, or even if you lose your health, or even if you are separated from your family, your faith in Jesus will never disappoint. That is the secret of contentment. And it's sometimes a painful secret to learn because we like all of those other things. It's nice to hear, yes, Jesus is the center of my life, but hey, I really like when he gives me all that other stuff too. But the secret of contentment, the secret of thanksgiving, to be able to give thanks always and in everything is this, that our faith is not in all the other stuff that Jesus gives us. He's gracious. He's good to us. He blesses us with so many good things in our nation, in our families, in our church. But those things are not the central part of our lives. Those things are not the secret of being content. If they were, if they were, then we should cancel Thanksgiving because we've had a bad year. But the secret of Thanksgiving, the secret of contentment, is that you have Jesus. And if you have Jesus, then you have every reason to give thanks, don't you? You have every reason to give thanks, even if you are enduring hardship. You have every reason to give thanks, even if you look around and you say, nothing's like it should be. That's true. It's not. But you have the one thing needful. In just a few minutes, we're going to hear these words of institution that we always hear. And I just want to draw your attention this morning to one aspect that I don't think I've ever really noticed. We're going to say, you're going to hear these words, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks. Jesus gave thanks even on the night of his betrayal. How could he do that? Well, he's celebrating the Passover, right? And so part of the thanksgiving that was part of the Passover was to give thanks for all of God's blessings before, how he had brought his people out of Egypt, how he had redeemed them from Pharaoh, how he had brought them through the dry land. But Jesus knew that he was about to be betrayed. Jesus knew that he was about to suffer many things. And yet he still gave thanks. He gave thanks because he was anticipating an even greater deliverance. He was anticipating something far greater than than Israel coming out of Egypt. He was anticipating something far better than Israel. Israel entering the promised land. He was anticipating his father's power to raise him from the dead. And that same kind of anticipation is open to you. For Christ has died and Christ has risen and now Christ is with you to give you that same hope. So that even in a year in which we look back and say, there's been a lot of hardships. There's been a lot of struggles. There's been a lot of things that didn't go the way that I had hoped, that didn't go the way I had prayed, that didn't go the way I had expected. Still, we can give thanks even as our Lord gave thanks on the night of his betrayal. Why? Because we have this great promise that he will never leave us or forsake us, that his mercy is true to us and new to us every morning, and that the anticipation that he had of being raised from the dead by the glory of his Father, that same anticipation belongs to you. So learn the secret. Learn the secret, not just of a little bit of information that you can take home and say, hey, I learned a secret. But learn the secret of contentedness, and you will have the secret also of thanksgiving. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and indeed he does. To him be the glory now and always. Amen. Let us rise together and confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed.